Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is our final panel for the Reclaiming Hamilton mini conference. Uh, it has been a series of fabulous and fascinating discussions, and we will be holding them on the Supercrawl page for 72 hours, so if you missed any parts of it, you can go back and find them um, and to catch up on some really great debates. Our last uh, panel for, for the conference is Citizens Take Control, and I think it's a really good note to end on because it's about how powerful the citizens of Hamilton are and what we've been doing to make our city even better than it is. Uh, and to have this discussion, I'm going to ask, we're going to turn it over to the dedicated activist, Lila Michelos. Um, and before I give her the floor, I'm just gonna let, tell you a little bit about Lila. Lila Michelos is a queer feminist labor activist. She is the host and producer of Center Stage at 101.5 FM The Hawk, chief negotiator for the OSSTF D21 OCTU, lay chaplain for the First Unitarian Church of Hamilton, and owner of Lila the Publicist, and a vocalist who is known for belting out show tunes. Some of Lila's many accolades include being named the Hamilton Independent Media Award Best Arts and Culture Journalist, Hamilton Pride Citizen of the Year, Hamilton Woman of the Year in Communication, Diamond Winner in the category of Public Relations in the Hamilton Spectators Reader's Choice Award, and a Mohawk College Alumni of Distinction, and she wears fabulous dresses. <laughs> Not, I just can't, I have to say, it, it's just fabulous. Anyhow, I'm gonna hand this over to Lila, and I know that she will lead us all in a brilliant discussion. And just before we begin that uh, discussion, I'm going to give us a land acknowledgement to just get ourselves in the right headspace before we, we begin. We respectfully acknowledge that the ancestral land and territory upon which we live and work is that of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee peoples. And this territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Treaty, and we intend to uphold this treaty agreement by sharing this territory responsibly respectfully and sustainably. And now I would like to introduce our two panelists. So uh, at the far left of the stage here, um, my left, your right, is Karen Burson, and she has had a long history of activism in the city from her work at Environment Hamilton, to found the Good Food Box Network to get affordable food to Hamiltonians, to her work as a lead facilitator of Hamilton's Ward 2 participatory budget process, to her most recent effort, PLAD, Peace, Love, Acceptance, Inclusion, and Diversity, which began as a counter protest to the appearance of different hate groups at Hamilton City Hall. So welcome, Karen. Thank you, Lana. And also joining us is Kevin McKay, one of the writers of Reclaiming Hamilton. And McK Kevin McKay is a writer, community organizer, union activist, and social science professor who has contributed a wonderful essay on his experience working to build the Sky Dragon Collective in Hamilton. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks. Good to be here. And I'm thrilled to have both of you here with me for this discussion. So. Um, both of you have connections with the Sky Dragon Center, and, yes. and even I have a connection with the Sky Dragon Center. So I'm, I'll start with you, Kevin. For those who don't know what the Sky Dragon is, can you talk to us about what this organization and the physical space that it became is? Yeah, so um, it was uh, a group of people who came together in the city of Hamilton um, in the late 2000s, or sorry, early 2000s. Um, and the, people who were concerned about a lot of things that were happening in terms of uh, downtown, uh, you know, uh, was really economically depressed. There was a lot of buildings getting knocked down. There were other issues around, you know, sort of poverty. There was environmental issues. There was a lot of different things that we wanted to, to address. And so it was a group of people that decided that we needed to create a community space and a space that could um, try to build community, build uh, progressive community in particular. So to bring together um, environmentalists, bring together uh, labor activists, bring together people who are working on downtown renewal, First Nations issues, LGBTQ issues, you name it. So we wanted to create kind of a big, a big stirring pot of all these energies um, and, uh, and to house it in a, a space where there was a cafe. And I mean, Karen started the, the most incredible cafe I think that's ever been, the Bread and Roses. Uh, we had a lot of different people doing different, different activities. So 
our building was at 27 King William Street, still is. And uh, we've just had a very long and interesting road and um, struggled a lot with the process of developing the, the project and realizing its goals. Uh, anyone who reads my, my chapter in Reclaiming Hamilton, it will, it will read somewhat like a story of failure and, and, and also partially success. And so uh, to me, that's, that's what community development and community organizing entails. It's, uh, it's a very mixed bag. So, um, so anyway, we're, we're still there. Uh, Relay Coffee is on the ground floor. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, um, organizations that do classes out of the center and uh, we're finally just to end off um, uh, in the process of doing a redevelopment that we've been planning for years and years and years it just took a long time for the stars to align so it'll make the center accessible it'll create more community spaces and create a bit of housing too wonderful yeah. now Karen I remember the bread and roses cafe because I used to host uh, uh, bisexual network of Hamilton meetings upstairs at the Sky Dragon back in the day and would come and get some yummy goodies from your cafe. Can you talk to us about what was your vision and mindset for that cafe and, and the politic behind that cafe and what, how, it, how it got displayed in the food that we bought from you? Oh, sure. Uh, the cafe, as, as Kevin described the Sky Dragon being a sort of an umbrella space for a lot of different points of view and members of the community. Um, the cafe um, was, I think, the heart of a lot of that in the, in the physical sense. That's where people would gather. There were comfy sofas, tables that you were free to move and rearrange according to how many people you were having a conversation with. Um, so it was that space for that openness, that welcome environment. It was also a space for local food sustainable food, ideally, and um, activism around food. I think even before we organized the cafe itself, we had events there. We had something called the Blackout Dinner to commemorate um, the big blackout that we had back in the day and look back at what we learned about what effect that had on community, that disruption of our routine. It meant that we were talking to our neighbors and that sort of thing. So that was just one of the events. So the cafe, um, when it came to be, um, in terms of the food, inspired by some experiences that Kevin had. We were famous for our bowls, and uh, the idea was to give people choice and to make it inclusive, so there were lots of gluten-free options. Uh, we even had an organic farm, Simpler Time, and then Plan B Farm, um, operate a market in that cafe space on Saturdays for a period of time, and that was, that was a great way to make that connection between the food on your plate and the people who grow that food and the values that were in that bowl of food. Uh, so yeah, it was a really special place. And, and your brownies were the brownies. famous, <laughs> famous throughout the GTHA, I would say. With the best name ever. I think Kevin came up with this. We called them our righteous decadence. Oh, righteous decadence <laughs> brownies, yeah. Fair trade brownies, so yeah. And uh, so that will always be a dear place for me. It was a place of welcome. We had events there. We had film screenings. We had guest speakers. And always with that uh, progressive heart beating through through everything that happened there. Now, under this theme of citizens taking control, how was the Sky Dragon taking control of our city? Good question. I think that it was um, an attempt by a group of people to try to have a material impact on uh, not just Hamilton, but also a greater impact. Um, we were inspired by a cooperative called Mondragon, and uh, for folks who want to do some more research, if they hear this name Mondragon, it's a Spanish cooperative, and uh, the world's largest worker-owned cooperative. Mm -hmm. And um, you know they they employ between sixty and seventy thousand workers. They have uh, over a hundred different uh, businesses that they operate. And um, they're a real force, like a real social and economic force. So we were inspired by that. Obviously, we're, we're a tiny, tiny um, uh, you know, version of that. But I think what we saw is that there were a number of issues that we needed to deal with as, as a society. We need to deal with uh, the fact that our current system is uh, not ecologically sustainable. I mean, we're, we're, we're literally destroying the biosphere. We're destroying the ecosystems that sustain us. Um, our economy is based on um, intense inequality, ex you know, accelerating inequality. Um, and so uh, we saw this directly in Hamilton, the lack of affordable housing, um, the poverty, the, you know, issues with substance abuse. I mean, all of that was going on downtown when we were downtown. There weren't a lot of other people doing <laughs> what we were trying to do uh, when we first started anyway, back in 2005. 
So um, I think what was important about it was it was realizing that pro quote unquote progressive people, people that want to see things like, you know, um, increases to minimum wages and, and better health care and, and uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, justice for um, LGBTQ people, people of color, those folks need to institutionalize their movements. They need to create spaces. They need to create uh, tangible um, examples of movement, right? So that could be, you know, housing cooperatives. It could be, uh, you know, community centers like we ran. It could be an amazing cafe that Karen created there, uh, the Bread and Roses. And so um, that's that was really the idea, was can a group of people come together and do that? And I think what we proved is yes, and also it's a lot harder than we thought. And also, um, it's difficult to know how to judge success and failure when you look back on a project like that. And, and if anything, what I sort of deal with in the article is it was a bit of, a bit of both, you know, in the sense of uh, partly being a successful example of community engagement, but also realizing the limitations as well. Now we talk about reclaiming Hamilton. I'm supposed to scooch. Am I scooching sufficiently? We're adjusting, adjusting seats, folks. Right. <laughs> Was I being shadowy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We're glad you're no longer part of the shadow organization that's <laughs> reclaiming I, I Hamilton. I because of my fat head, let oh. be noted. <laughs> now, talking about, in a very literal sense, about reclaiming Hamilton, I'd like to talk about the organization that you helped to found, Karen Plaid. So Hamilton, sadly, is well known in our country for being the hate crime capital of Canada. And uh, one of the manifestations of this has been regular weekly get-togethers from various hate groups taking over um, the, the forecourt of our city hall. And there have been citizens very proactively working towards dismantling that. And without me talking any further about it, I'd like to talk, uh, let the person who's been one of the people dismantling that talk about her organization and how they've been working towards dismantling hate here in Hamilton. Karen. Yes, the forecourt. Um, the gathering of the hate groups uh, was something that I heard about at a time when I just didn't want to hear about it. I had just been through four years of um, having my own business, being completely financially, emotionally, physically exhausted from it, glad to have some freedom in my life again, and this whole thing just upset the apple cart. I found out about these groups, uh, chiefly the Hamilton Yellow Vests, uh, gathering at our city hall in order to promote values that I really felt were counter to the values that I think that we believe in as Hamiltonians. Um, the Yellow Vests in Canada are kind of well known for their far right leanings. They take their name from a movement that started in France. Uh, they were against the carbon tax, a few other things. Um, but in North America, the word yellow vest came to mean something different. It came to be associated with anti-immigration policies. It became associated with pro-pipeline movements, um, anti-UN sentiments. Um, and also their alignment with known hate groups. That's the part that really stuck in my craw, as they say. Um, as somebody who lives downtown, I'm practically living in the shadow of City Hall. I felt like it was offensive to me to be trying to go through my neighborhood, minding my own business, but having a fear of these far-right groups and the hatred they represent and the violence that they gladly espoused in my own neighborhood, in our public square, a location that to me symbolizes our city and all of its residents, and a space that should have been welcoming to all citizens, and I didn't feel safe being there. Part of me wanted to just forget about it and hang out at home and not have to deal with the fear, but there is just enough anger in me um, that I felt like I needed to get involved. I didn't have to do much. I just physically needed to be there 
to counter their presence, to show that not everyone in Hamilton was okay with what they were doing. And I thought I was in good company. There were other organizations present. Some of the uh, city's uh, labor organizations were there. Uh, there were um, musicians that I knew. Um, so a real hodgepodge, mixed match group of ordinary Hamiltonians just being there saying, no, we're not cool with this. Um, there was some friction. Um, some of us may have even seen or participated in this physical um, scuffles. And, and the violence, unfortunately, escalated over um, the period of time that the yellow vests were there. Um, there were more of us who got involved who believed that it was up to us as citizens to do something about the presence of these hate groups in our public square because our civic leaders, uh, Hamilton Police Services, all the people who are supposed to be looking after us did not seem to be looking after us. And what started out in December 2018 December 2018, grew to something even more ugly as the weeks and months went by, where some of those hate groups were known to be um, engaging in actual hateful activities. Um, do we need to go over what went on at Pride that year? Do we need to talk about the lack of response on the part of the police department initially that degenerated into um, such a confrontational, um, hostile uh, feeling that seemed to be directed at the citizens. A lot of us felt like we weren't being protected and we were not cool with that. So it, it continued to be a space of some conflict, but also a, a space where people could gather and build community. And that was the part that I found really interesting that people who had uh, different reasons for being there could ga gather and uh, use our energy and our resources to work towards a more positive change, towards pushing out the hate by making more space for peace and the values that, that hold meaning for us. And the words peace, love, acceptance, inclusion, and diversity uh, were words that were put out there on social media and through posters by my co-organizer in this, uh, Sean Dowling. Um, he, he's not here on the panel today, but um, we were trying to say to people as they were walking by, as they were driving by, that the lack of truth the lack of acceptance that was happening there was not going to be what would prevail in this situation. People driving through Hamilton on that main thoroughfare were not only going to see hatred, they were going to see the love and the things that we believed in. And I happened to notice that peace, love, acceptance, inclusion, and diversity spell plaid, so <laughs> that's the name of, the, of their group. <coughs> Now, Kevin, you and I have, have gone to some of these uh, counter-protests that uh, Karen and Sean have uh, organized. Can you share your reflections on what you saw and heard when you were there? Yeah, I, I, you know, I echo what, what Karen was saying, and I was really just impressed by you know, Karen stepping forward and just doing what it is you need to do in situations like this, which is you can't just turn a blind eye to it, um, you know, and, and she just really engaged it, her and Sean. And, you know, the Peace and the Hammer Choir, all these other yeah. great groups that, that were down there. There was uh, the Pride folks would come down. Um, I know my union, I'm a member of OPSU Local 240. It's the college professors at Mohawk. Uh, we would, you know, come down there on a regular basis. OSSTF would come down. So it, I, I think it's really neat that it's, um, it's an example of how uh, struggle or, you know, and I think that really was what it was. These weren't one-off demonstrations. This was a pro protracted struggle. This was the people of Hamilton saying, the hate will not take over. You will not win. You can't own our city hall, right? All that stuff. And so through that process of struggle, it's such a fertile place to bring groups together um, that maybe they should be hanging out, they should be talking, but they often don't just because we're all in our own silos, we're all fighting our own battles. But it's, it's really kind of neat, and I've seen that throughout my own history of activism in Hamilton, that um, doing is incredibly important. You know what I mean? Like, the, there's the proverbial, we can sit around and talk in meetings and, and just bore each other to death. But if you actually get a concrete action together, which is um, appropriate in the sense that it sends the right message, you know, it's inclusive, it's all these things that you did with Plaid, right? You create a space that's welcoming 
people will come there and then they're talking and they're 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 plotting and scheming together in the best possible way plotting and scheming for good things uh not for uh for you know sort of hateful divisive things so yeah my experience was was that you know it was it was just it was a really great space to do some organizing to make the community better and to um take a clear stand against things that need to need to be denounced and what i have noticed is some of the people that were involved in wearing yellow vest and um, protesting Trudeau and the lack of pipelines in our neighborhood um, <clears throat> seem to have morphed into anti-mask protests. Um, yeah. It seems to be a lot of the same group of people. And, and I'm, I'm wondering what, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask the two of you, your thoughts about what the connect is there. What, why why this, this seems to bring in the same crowd come, coming to those, those kind of protests. I'll, I'll throw that at you first, Karen. Yeah, that really struck me as well, the crossover of membership. Mm -hmm. uh, we would see um, somebody like Paul Fromm. Yeah. Yep. Who is um, yep. well known for his far right beliefs, holding hands with the yellow vests, who are holding hands with the three percenters, showing up at each other's rallies. Um, a major manifestation of this um, coalition of hate was what happened the uh, night that uh, Maxine Bernier came to Hamilton mm. to speak at Mohawk College. And uh, that was, it was just, you could not have seen a more clearer. Uh, a sign of how these groups were gathering and sharing their common fears, mistrust of others, um, wanting to take Canada backwards in a way, and their willingness to use force to push forward their values. And this is where I have a, a certain amount of acceptance for other ideas. Absolutely, if you're a right-wing person, if you're a good old conservative along the lines of like Joe Clark, you know, I'm being um, almost nostalgic for the days of that type of conservative, um, that's fine. But when you get to the point where um, you're espousing hatred, you're wanting to, um, you know, make Canada a place that is not tolerant and it's not all of the things that I grew up believing were Canadian values. If that's the way you're talking, um, I, have to, I have to protest, I have to be there. And I don't necessarily have to fight you back physically. Um, for example, the um, Love and the Hammer Choir was there at Mohawk that night. Um, they were singing, they were singing about positivity. And it, I think what that showed us is, oh, I think we learned a lot of things like that. Yeah. That the far right can commit um, acts of violence with impunity in Hamilton, because that happened that night. Uh, one of our supporters was attacked by uh, Bernier's security detail. Mm -hmm. uh, the police did nothing. Um, and unfortunately, that's a pattern that's being repeated across the country, across North America, as uh, the far right is emerging as um, something different from what it was. Now there's a, a, a hatred to it and a willingness to accept violence that we have to, we have to draw a line there and say this is not how we express differences in Canada. Yeah. Uh, it's it's um, I, I agree with what you're saying. It's it's um, an interesting time politically. I think we would all agree. Now that may sound like a trite thing to say, but I'm getting at this idea that there's this this polarization, political polarization. You hear it talked about all the time in the media, but there's a specific aspect to it which I find is is uh, worrisome and it is somewhat new. It's this proliferation of kind of misinformation and really sort of skewed, distorted worldviews. And so I think that Lila, you're right. It's it may seem weird, but actually not really, that these groups can just morph into what's the latest expression for really, I think, you know, the, the sort of sociological analysis of where that's coming from is um, an economy that has been not serving working people for years and years and years. Um, a lot of hardship, a lot of mistrust of government, mistrust of institutions, a lot of people feeling that they're not represented at all in, in the sort of institutions and structures of, of politics. So, 
Um, when that need and that anger isn't spoken to, I mean, it gets captured by all sorts of weird currents. You have people tuning in to, to jackasses like Alex Jones and stuff like that and, 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 and looking at these conspiracy theories. I mean, this is the phenomenon of Donald Trump in, in, in the States. And I think that this is <coughs> what we're sort of seeing in Hamilton is, is our own little echo of that. We saw that in Bernier as well, Maxime Bernier um, and, uh, you know, and his, his ridiculous um, political party. So yeah, it is a, is a, is a very kind of um, scary time politically, and I think it is more imperative um, than ever that people stand up and do the sorts of things that, um, that Karen was doing at the forecourt that we try to do at Sky Dragon. Um, the one thing I would just throw it in, if, if, if folks want to talk about this, it'd be great, is just that I think we also have to learn a lot about how we might contribute unwittingly to polarization, and also how do you actually deal with these, these um, angry, disillusioned masses that are voting for someone like Donald Trump, can you write them all off? Can you just sort of say that they're all racist? Well, there was a lot of black and Latino voters that voted for Trump in this last election. So things are complicated, and I think that it's important that, uh, as folks that I would consider myself on the left anyway, um, that we get better at listening to people who are disaffected and also talking to them in a way that they understand. And so these are sorts of things that I don't know if, if you felt that was sort of playing out as well in terms of the anti-racist activities in Hamilton. Uh, yes, and I think a lot of the crossover is enabled through social media. Uh, and we, that's a whole other, <laughs> we could have a whole other conversation about the, how the um, environment in social media has facilitated these groups getting together figuring out what their common values are, organizing. So the same tools that we celebrated um, when we saw the, the potential of social media are the same things that are allowing the sort of um, dumbing down of conversation, the growing polarization and feeding that, um, and the, the nature of the technology being so impersonal. I think that's why organizing and being there physically in person, having eye contact with people driving by, literally eye contact at 35 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, those are, are uh, encounters that um, have the chance to get us out of this. Um, and you can see a lot of the organization um, in the far right and the hate groups. You can see that it comes almost directly from the United States uh, in some of the languages, language that's used in some of the um, terminology. They'll use expressions like freedom of speech. Well, no, that's not what we have here. That's down in that country. Um, I don't know. It seems like what we have is a set of people who do have legitimate issues. And I think a lot of them are just choosing the wrong enemy because that enemy has been identified by external actors as being the foreigners, as being the LGBTQ community, as being the indigenous people, and on down the line of people who um, should be blamed for our circumstance. What they're failing to see is it's a much broader situation that's brought us all together to the forecourt. It's um, neoliberal liberalism it's um capitalism it's, it, it's capitalism yeah. oh you it's, said the c word Lala. I did. You said, can we can we get into that <laughs> yes please because we're yes, finally please. getting into that <laughs> yeah. in a really open way yeah. mm -hmm. uh, there was a time let's say five years ago in the olden days when daring to question capitalism was enough for you to be branded a communist or whatever yeah. label they wanted to throw on you but we're all in a situation that has been um made quite clear uh, because of COVID and all the weaknesses in capitalism that have just been thrown in front of us. And there's no denying that those problems are there and that we have to look at what the sources of those problems actually are. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is because um, there's concentrated ownership of media and all these other issues that the far right will actually you know, call out as it's a problem. Well, media, big media is a problem. Well, big media is kind of a problem. We need to address that. I don't need to be a communist now to question that stuff. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting that um, when you talk about um, whether you know whether it's the media or these different. Um, it's like there's confusion, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. When you talk to these people, um, and this is what I think is, is sometimes interesting. I'm not I'm not trying to 
put forward the perspective that, oh, we just need to dialogue with the racists and everything will be okay. Like, I, I don't want to put that forward. I think, you know, Karen and other folks know that I, I'm, I'm all about confronting that when it needs to happen. But when you do talk to some of the people, not the hardcore folks, what immediately comes apparent is there's so much confusion. There really is. It's like there's, there's legitimate deprivation, there's legitimate issues in the sense that these are people who, they're not winning at life. Like, they really aren't. When you, when you, when you talk to these folks, they're not wealthy, they're not well-connected, they're not comfortable. Like, these are people that are experiencing a hardship, it's objective, and yet their understanding of the hardship. So, so they're not thinking capitalism, Lila. They're thinking immigrants. They're thinking, oh, it's all this, you know, damn so political correctness. So socialists taking away those coal uh, mines and, and putting in, um, you know, wind farms. They're yeah. taking away my jobs. Yeah, yes. exactly, yeah. right? And, and it really is. Um, so to me, it's kind of fascinating that there's an underlying crisis, which is leading to all this unrest, right? The underlying crisis of which, again, is kind of a crisis of neoliberal capitalism. We live in a society where it is not working for a growing number of people, uh, while it's also destroying uh, the basis for our physical existence, right? And, and, and doing what it's doing to the environment. Um, you know, in the States, to a lesser extent in Canada, it's, it's also murdering black and brown people. Like, you know, to the tune of about, what, a thousand people a year, American police kill. So there's all these dysfunctions, but then how people understand Understand that and then based on that how they act to change it is so critical and I think that you know one of the themes that I tried to deal with in my my uh, chapter in the book was as citizens we can do what's in front of us to do we can do what's in our capabilities in the sense that you start local you 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 pick up a task you get to work or you get behind something that's groovy in your community I think that is where it starts but also there's a relationship between the local work we do and these extra local contexts. Like we also have to be talking about the bigger system. We also have to be linking our local struggles to this idea of like, yeah, you can do so much locally, right? With your, your organization or your community center or whatever. Um, but a lot of the limits you're gonna bump into are because of this broader neoliberal capitalist, colonial racist, you name it, you know, system that we live in. So it's a challenge to, to blend those things together, I find, in activism. Now, talking about the, the U.S. election that seems to have never quite ended, uh, even now, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the one thing I found really stunning for me was when I saw lineups for days on end and people willing to wait for hours, that's the kind of political drive and activism I see when people want to unseat someone. Mm -hmm. Like when people want change, that's the kind of turnout I see at an election. So when the results came out that over 70 million Americans voted for Trump, and, and you're just like, what? Why? Uh, and, and then I'm, I'm listening to this commentary and people who were Trump supporters, and there seems to be when you're in a right-leaning politic, it seems to be like the leader, you do not defy the leader, you defend the leader at all costs, but I find from a liberal-leaning socialist perspective, unionist, activist, labor activist, we are critical of our leaders because we're, we're meant to, we're as citizens, as members of our union, we, we need to critically ask those questions. So I, I have to figure out that mindset that says we do not question our leader, our, our leader, we need to defend our leader at all costs to, hey, we appreciate our leader and we appreciate what they stand for, but if you screwed something up, we're going to let you know that you screwed up kind of thing. And, and those two different mindsets and where they're coming from, because that was one of the stunning things coming out of that election when I'm thinking more locally, where we're having a lot of frustration with our current leadership around the horseshoe at City Hall. Um, a, a lot of people who've maybe been there a bit too long and a little lack of creativity, enthusiasm from the citizens when it comes to municipal elections because the turnout for municipal elections is dreadful um, and when there is a choice why are we not choosing some change and what what's happening there so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking the parallels is what happened with the US election and what's happening locally and how do we ignite our our citizens to be more engaged in local politics and I'm a little having just recently run for uh, municipal office, stunned that we're not a little more engaged in it because this is your sewer systems, this is collecting your garbage. These are the things we deal with every day kind of thing, not big ideas like neoliberalism and capitalism is killing us all. This is like, is somebody picking up my garbage today, right? So I know I, I threw a really big meta question at <laughs> It's a good one, though. It's so unlike you, Lila, to do that. 
<laughs> um, but uh, Karen, like troublemaker. What, what do we what do we need to do to be engaging our, our our fellow Hamiltonians to get more active in in that reality of politics? Okay, there's two big obstacles. Okay. Um, one of them, time. We're working longer hours than ever before. Time pressure is on everybody. It's even more intense now, especially for women in COVID, especially women who have to work and mind children at the same time. Um, depending on your economic circumstances, you may be doing two or three jobs. There is no time to get engaged in the way that you would want to if you even think about these things. Uh, so. That's one thing. The other thing is the belief that your involvement will make a difference. I think a lot of people feel unheard. They feel alienated from politics. They're mistrustful of leaders. That's fed a lot of this. Um, uh, um, I think a lot of the yellow vest uh, thinking comes from uh, that area, that feeling of mistrust. Um, over the years, I've read articles every now and again about how conservative brains are different from liberal brains. Some of the ideas are that uh, conservatives tend to be, uh, they see things in more black and white terms. And what you said very much alluded to that. Um, so they feel like they want definite answers. And if you're a strong man and you can give them definite answers, they're going to back you all the way. They accuse liberals of being wishy-washy. I don't think wishy-washy is necessarily such a bad thing because wishy-washy thinking allows room for subtlety and things that aren't so black and white, things that sort of feel good but hurt at the same time. That kind of flexibility of mind, I think, might be what separates uh, the left and the right in some ways. Uh, I think that, like, uh, that's interesting how you talk. I've, I've read those those studies too, right, that suggest that there's, there's some sort of... Um you know, whether it's a structural or just sort of a uh, behavioral difference between the cognition of, you know, conservatives versus liberals, right? There may be some truth to that, I don't know. But I think what's interesting too is you can also elicit that effect by making people afraid. Do you know what I mean? So you can just take, even if you don't pretend that there's any sort of, or suggest that there's any sort of underlying, uh, you know, brain differences, you know, I, I don't know if there is or not, but you can certainly create that by again, making people afraid, putting them under stress and then also giving them a handy narrative to help them understand that, you know? And I think that um, it's so true that when we talk about the far right, the narrative they give people is very simple. It's very, it's, uh, I don't want to use the word elegant because it's not elegant, but it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to understand. Oh, these are the bad people. It's, the, it's you know, very consumable. It is, mm -hmm. and, it, and you don't have to think too hard, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's true with, with um, I think a lot of progressive politics, we're asking people to think, we're asking people to think, think critically. And to me, that gets back to just like, again, then how are we engaging people, you know? And um, I just watched a, a great um, a video of Jane McAlevey, and um, she is a, an amazing organizer from SEIU in the United States. And um, she writes a lot about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. So if you want to change communities, if you want to change the political system, um, the idea of mobilizing is like, well, get your people out, right? It's kind of like, like what, what, what sort of happens in the vote a lot. Um, you know, you speak to your own converted folks, you want to get them to do things, you're, you're mobilizing people. And her whole point is, if that's all you're doing, you're in big trouble, because what organizing does is it builds your constituency. And that means talking to people that don't already agree with you, right? And those are difficult conversations, you know? And so I just think that that's a real challenge. I know one of the things that I think was successful about Sky Dragon is we explicitly started with that, um, philosophy. We, we started with the philosophy of like, yeah, okay, we're lefties, everybody knows that, but we don't care if you are a liberal, an NDP, or a Green Party, a social democratic, communist, a socialist, an anarchist, we, just, we didn't care, right? And I think that that created a space where it wasn't always perfect, but when it worked is you'd have this wonderful blend of people in the space. And um, also people could just walk off the street who were completely apolitical, but they'd be like, wow, this is a groovy place and these brownies are flipping amazing. <laughs> and so if you didn't get them with the, with the, uh, the groovy environment, you get them with the brownies, right? But I think there was, there was a lesson in there for me about how to be successful at organizing, how to be successful at community action is 
you cannot become so strident and so judgmental and so rigid in your own ideology, even if you think it's a damn good ideology, which most of us tend to do, right? We think our, our stuff is spot on. But if you're coming at people like that, then I think that you don't have a chance of reaching out to people who very well could become allies. And, and that's just something maybe I can talk about a little later on in terms of the gentrification uh, thing in downtown Hamilton. That was, I think, a big mistake people made is there was too much polarization, too much rigidity. And Anyway. Well, and I can share with you from my years of queer activism and especially my 10 years on the um, board of uh, Hamilton Pride that it was that face-to-face -face connection. And, and I also look back at my past as a Jehovah's Witness and shamelessly knocking on people's doors that I could shamelessly walk into a business and say, here's my Hamilton Pride sponsorship package. Would you like to be a sponsor for Pride? Hey, can I put a poster up? Hey, do you want to give us some stuff for our silent auction? Thanks. Yes, shamelessly going up to people and asking for things was something that was inbred into me long ago. But but, but I found that eye contact, that making a connection with people, um, that demystified being queer mm. because they'd be like, oh, you're, you're the pride girl. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And they'd remember me and they made a personal connection. They remembered my name and then I was less scary because I wasn't this unknown factor that was this thing they heard about that they think they should be scared of. So sometimes it's just that. Mm -hmm. uh, but... When we talked about the 70 million plus people that voted for Trump, I do have to say, yeah, some of them are racist, and and that's exactly why they voted for Trump. And and in Canada, we like doing this this thing where oh oh well, at least we're not the states, but yeah, the same the same craps here too. And and I, I see it happen far too often where somebody gets confronted with their racism and gets called out on it. And apparently, it's more offensive to call you out for your racism than for being racist, mm -hmm. which is another thing that happens over and over again. So as marginalized communities try to confront these power structures that are predominantly white, male, cis, able-bodied, and say, hey, I'm looking at it with this lens, and I'm telling you, you have put up a barrier to access for me because this is where you come at it. And when I tell you you're sexist or you're racist or you're homophobic or whatever it is, you get your back up with me instead of saying, oh, crap, am I? What did I do? How can I fix this? Like, and, and that's more and more what I'm seeing the responses coming from our local leadership. And it didn't used to be that way. They used to be able to take that critical feedback and go, hey, leader of this marginalized community, wow, okay, we need to work on this, let's do it. Now it's how dare you tell me kind of thing. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not sure if that attitude is coming drifting as a as an ill wind from <laughs> south of the border but it's not just the US it's it's a worldwide phenomenon these strong men that say nothing really but somehow ignite their base whether it's Bolsonaro or Boris Johnson or Orban and and my um, grandparents home country of Hungary like it's it's everywhere right now it's very ugly and it's very and as marginalized community member uh, it's it's frightening because I was horrified to find out if Trump won because I was like <sighs> Ooh, ooh, not not good, not not good at all. It was it was abs fear inducing of of the highest order. So I'm yeah. Fear is what got me involved in the forecourt. Just feeling like um, no at no time in my life did I ever feel afraid to walk through my neighborhood because I'm a black woman. And the emergence of these groups really changed that and I felt like I needed to do something so if I think I, I, I'm thinking so many thoughts based on what you said there um, I think going into um, that space that anti-racism work uh, was new for me and it was terrifying but I did bring a lot of the knowledge that I gained from food security work and, and activism in, in that sphere uh, one of the things that I had to learn was how to manage people with different opinions very helpful in participatory budgeting when when I was dealing with community but in agriculture it's it's a big tent and we have to apply that kind of thing Thinking because there are old style agriculture people versus the organic farmers and how are they going to get together and move things forward. So I think the ability to use skills from 
other facets of our lives and bring them to our activism can be really helpful. And another thing that I learned about um, sort of building the movement has to do with the importance of mentoring. I wasn't seeing a lot of mentoring of um, uh, racialized communities in the food movement, and I find that quite disturbing. Um, but eventually, um, black and indigenous people stood up at gatherings like Food Secure Canada and said, hey, you're, you've got this old style colonialist way of thinking and organizing our events and how we're supposed to work in this movement. You guys need to start listening to us. And so there was a lot of mentoring that happened there that I think needs to happen in the movement that we're trying to, to work on as Plaid. So for example, I heard about somebody organizing a march um, it, over the summer when Black Lives Matter was really active. And I was like, okay, who is she? What does she know? Does she know what she's getting into? She might get hate groups showing up. What's going on? So there was a reaching out that took place. And I said, oh, well, OK. So oh my gosh, you're in your early 20s. You've never done this before. OK, let me connect you with Sarah Jama, who is an experienced activist. You guys need to talk and get together, talk about safety and how we can make this work. And um, the mentoring is also happening in the other way around. I'm learning about mentoring and how it works. I used to think it was all about an experienced elder imparting wisdom. No, when I work with young people, I'm learning a ton. I'm learning new ways of speaking and um, expressions like, um, oh, here's uh, one that was new to me that completely blew me away, uh, microaggressions. like. Heck's a microaggression. What are you talking about? You're using all this obscure language, and it's like, no, that just means um, somebody's really inconsiderate. And I, I thought back, and it's like, oh yeah, I get microaggressions every day. Although sometimes I want to say microaggressions, they're just aggressions. <laughs> <laughs> they are sort of more subtle aggressions. But yeah, they're, they're real. So I can't even remember what the question was that got me talking. Just, I, I just wanted to jump real sure, quick. Sure, go ahead. Um, so yeah, like you're, you're talking about um, what you're able to do when you're doing your food movement um, activism. And uh, like to me, that's... That's exactly what organizing is all about. Like you, you had to work with different constituents that had a different view of the issues of the problem. They had different interests, right? Different mm -hmm. material interests sometimes. And yet, at the end of the day, you realize that you're only going to get change in that area if you can build some sort of consensus and some sort of collective power, right? And that that is what we're faced with over and over again. That is simply the task that we have to engage in. If if you're if you're someone who's progressive and you want to change things for the better. You can't just have your own super secret, totally ideological, pure little cadre, right, of three people who are going to go out and, you know, tell everyone else how, how it's supposed to go down. It just doesn't work. We've seen it over and over again. I've seen that, like, ad nauseum. And we saw that through Sky Dragon, too. We saw that in the gentrification um, sort of uh, battle that played out in downtown Hamilton, that um, it, as soon as people were not able to speak to the quote-unquote middle, things fall apart and when things fall apart who steps in and wins is big money <laughs> all the time. Every time because they're well financed and they have people who are paid to do the work that community organizers just do because we know it needs to be done right so I just think that's a really important thing is like how do we do that how do we like like you're saying uh, earlier Lila we have to call things out right like if we see um, uh, inequities homophobia racism whatnot very very clearly we have to call these things out and yet also how can we have a dialogue with people who maybe maybe they don't have the perfect analysis maybe they're going to say some stupid things at a meeting because they've never been to they've never been in a space like that and that's like a, kamala harris is a radical socialist yeah, exactly. <laughs> i don't know how she got in i don't know how either. did she slip through right i know but but there again it's interesting like you can you know I'm, uh, thanks for saying that because you can be critical and i have been on facebook and gotten a lot of heat of it a lot of heat for it i'm so glad trump lost I'm not a fan of Biden and Harris in terms of their politics. I'm just not, but I'm happy that they won, right? But I mean, how can we have conversations and debates about that such that we also aren't scorching the earth and burning bridges such that we can still realize, you know what, we're gonna agree on 80%. This 20%, We'll either shelve it or we'll keep working on that. We'll have more conversations, right? And my sense is that's what 
hopefully, if you get engaged in community organizing, you learn those things real time. Because if you try and come in preaching at everyone and from your ideological pure vantage point, your stuff's not going to fly. And it's going to melt down over and over again. But eventually, I think people learn that it doesn't mean, like you said, you don't call things out, but you get smarter at realizing that there are other human beings out there you're going to need to connect with and you're mm -hmm. going to need to sort of um, build relationships with, right? And that's a tough thing to do. Now, Karen, uh, to bring up a point that you brought up that the pandemic is really revealing the cracks in the capitalist system, mm -hmm. and then you talked about gentrification as well. Um, the combination of capitalism, uh, the pandemic, and gentrification really came to a head as this toxic ball combination when we saw the homeless camps and the yes. tents that popped up all over the city yeah. and the response from those in power to to those t uh, tent cities. And I, I'd like to give you a moment for the two of you to, to comment on what you saw transpire and unravel and also the groups that came together to help protect those who are in the most need and have been most impacted by this pandemic and by city where right now a one bedroom apartment is going to cost you $1,500, which is totally unrealistic. Who, if you're working a minimum wage job, is going to be able to afford that? No one. So uh, I'm done my rent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, so this is this really strikes to, I guess, the heart of what I was trying to get at in, in the chapter that I wrote for the book, which was what just one perspective was on quote unquote the great gentrification debate that happened it was like you know 2010 11 thereabouts um in hamilton where we could see it coming and yet it, it hadn't really had the kinds of devastating effects that you know that that we've seen along with that people are going to hate on me some positive effects right some life coming back down to the downtown core in terms of businesses and whatnot i mean buildings not getting torn down like it was it was very much a mixed bag i think but but with real real um serious consequences to me the overwhelming one was housing like housing was completely not factored in um the city completely failed like 100 percent failed in the ability to get ahead of the process and realize development was coming and to me because, and this has sort of, I guess, been a theme throughout this, we can't wait for the people in power to do these things. We just can't. And so what does it mean then for us to do them? Well, from, from hindsight, I guess, and looking back at how the gentrification uh, sort of scenario played out, it was unfortunate because I think if various stakeholders were able to come together and realize that they had sort of a collective interest in um, maintaining vibrant, inclusive communities, um, that I think I think things could have turned out very differently, but instead I think what happened was there was a lot of mistrust Polarization there was a lot of people who were in the sort of hardcore anti-gentrification camp that um, Maybe had a great analysis, but they were really Black and white in terms of how they looked at for instance a small gallery owner on James Street who was barely paying their rent and who was going to get wiped out in a couple months anyway, right? And like those people could have been natural allies and yet that's not what happened, right? And by the same token too, there was a lot of people who were running little shops or galleries or whatnot on James who just felt so completely and totally morally justified because they were a small business owner that they couldn't listen to people who were like, yeah, but what about the homeless people? What about people getting pushed out? What about rising rents, right? Um, and unfortunately, you know, as I sort of said before, that I think the feedback was when when the people on the ground are unable to come together and build collective power, then it's 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 easy who wins. It is. It's the big money and the big rents. And then you're right. You have a situation right now, which is completely untenable in the city. People cannot live. They cannot survive. And it's um, it's it's a horrendous horrendous failure of of uh, of the city and. Um, I think sadly a failure in organizing, although there's groups like Indwell that are doing amazing work. There are some people who are really trying to get this stuff done, but anyway, that was, that was a bit of a rant, but. Well, I guess it's my turn. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> um, resources, we're constantly competing for them. So mm -hmm. I mentioned time earlier, time's an important resource, um, but also that um, ability to uh, get people together, to, put energy and resources towards solving problems. We're all in competition for them. Um, in the nonprofit sector, 
At the moment, we actually are getting some much needed resources because there has been recognition that something needs to be done, that housing is a priority. Um, but still, we have to compete with other um, ideas. For example, council was really interested in talking about the Commonwealth Games in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah. So it's not like we're short of resources, it's having the will to allocate them and, to, and use them in ways that actually reflect what the community is saying it desperately needs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, having sort of the resilience to organize. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're somebody who's working three jobs, you're not gonna have that much energy to go and organize, engage, in, and do all those important things. And so I think um, one of the things that we have to get better at is getting those resources. So that takes skill, that takes the whole community realizing that the solutions are within our grasp. We just need to enable people, like free them up to, to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. Because as you're saying, the, the big corporate interests have no shortage of resources. No, and you're so right. Capturing resources and mobilizing them is, is incredibly difficult. It is the one thing that tends to really immediately limit any kind of positive community um, activity. It's not insurmountable. I mean, you know, Sky Dragon's an, an example. Um, we had a lot of people saying they loved the idea when we first um, were talking about it. Um, absolutely no one would fund it. <laughs> like, we literally asked everyone. We, we applied to every foundation uh, going, um, the city, you name it. Even when it was up, so, so, so how we had to fund it was through, through um, selling community bonds. And it was mm -hmm. incredible, incredible local community members who, who staked their money, you know, and, uh, and at a, a thousand bucks um, a pop and uh, were able to get that, that project off the ground. And um, it, was, um, it was very, very touch and go because of that. Uh, but it's funny, even after we, we, we started Sky Dragon and it was really rocking, and like you mentioned being at meetings upstairs, uh, on a good night you'd have like five different meetings going on in different parts of the building and it would just be incredibly full of life. And we would have representatives from the various foundations come by and be like, oh, this is amazing, mm. we love what you're doing, it's so exciting, we're not gonna help you, but keep doing it, oh, it's incredible. <laughs> we're and never like, gonna. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back next yeah. year. We won't give you money, but yeah. it's so yeah. good. Thank you for doing yeah. what you're doing. And we'd be like, great, thank yeah. you. That's awesome. You know, which is part of the reason why there is no more Bread and Roses Cafe. And there is no more Mayday Magazine, whatever, whatever. We just never got the support. And yet, not to make it sound super bleak, a group of people came together and were able to get it done because the resources were there from community members who had the, the wherewithal, from unions, you know, some, some, some solid local politicians, like there were some really, really neat people. And they are out there. And like, like, like you said, Karen, part of the challenge for us is how do you get those resources? And then how do you put them to work in a way that is actually effective so that then the people who contribute are like, hell yeah. Yeah, and here's some more. Yeah. And this is the thing, it doesn't really always take that much mm. to keep what you're doing supported. Yeah. Um, and Biden's mm. campaign was made up of really small, if I can't remember the, the dollar figure, but a, a lot of really small donations. Um, Plaid, uh, we got started just hanging out in the snow in the winter time. We stuck it out through the spring. We were there every day in the summer. I'm thinking, I need Saturdays off. I haven't had one in four <laughs> years, but okay, I'll go. And by the time the, the Bernier thing came about, and then one of our people got physically attacked by one of the yellow, uh, two of the yellow vests working in tandem. Um, by the time winter came around, we were feeling pretty worn out. But what kept us going was the little bit of support that we were starting to get from our community partners. Number one, the labor movement. Uh, as uh, a worker at St. Matthew's House, uh, the member of QP, 5167, and uh, Kevin, uh, through his union, also got us some support. My union said, here's some coffee money. You know what, we never ended up actually using it, but what that did to energize us Mm. to feel that support from the community, like we could offer a, a hot cup of coffee or a hot chocolate to anyone walking by. It was, it was amazing. Um, somebody showing up with a tent <laughs> to shelter us and a little bit of heat. All of that kept us going. It was really COVID 
that knocked us out. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was an unforeseeable circumstance, really. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say really quickly, um, it's so true that um, earlier on I mentioned that progressive movements need to institutionalize themselves, right? So, so you know, working class people, you know, members of marginal communities, y you need means, you need power, you need organization, you need buildings, you need whatever it is, right? And it's not surprising that the organizations we're talking about that are funding all this are institutionalized manifestations of the labor movement, their unions, right? Like this is what working people did, you know, um, a couple hundred years ago is they got together, they realized they needed to form associations that represented their own interests. There's problems, like uh, I'd be the first to say, as someone who's, who's um, been involved in union politics for a long time, there's issues with how they function, and yet still they are organizations of working class people. And that's exactly what we need to keep doing. We need to keep building those organizations, whether it's pride, whether it's plaid, whether it's, you know, um, to express these important needs or whether it's the great work that 350.org does in Hamilton or the organization that got me active in, in, uh, in Hamilton was the Friends of Red Hill Valley. You know, so talk about an incredible environmental organization that, you know, was a, was a powerhouse in this city uh, to try to do the right thing and, and unfortunately, um, you know, in ways they failed, in other ways, in other ways they didn't. But um, yeah, that's that's the game. How do we institutionalize these movements and keep them moving forward, and then actually um, accomplish some of the goals that we need to? And organizing how that we're going to work together, because coming from that work that we did at the forecourt, um, we were able to, a few of us got together and organized a meeting that took place at the, the library back in February, so just before COVID hit. Okay. And we reached out to educators, unions, uh, faith groups, peace organizations. We thought maybe 10 people would show up at this meeting. There were 50 there. Wow, nice. All interested in working together yeah. to, um, you know, organize against what we saw as something that was negative happening in Hamilton. And uh, it's funny that having all these people gathered in a room, it, it's very powerful. Okay, you can have all the Zoom meetings you want, but there's nothing like being in that space, mm -hmm. breaking that bread, breathing that same air mm. <laughs> that um, can give a movement its strength. So our organizing actually had to take a step back due to COVID, yeah. but I'm seeing a resurgence of organizing online as we're getting better at it and more knowledgeable and, and understanding the, the intricacies of doing it right is starting to, to take hold. So, yeah. And that's going to help overcome barriers like people not having enough time, not having the bus fare to get to that meeting. Well, yeah. hopefully you've got some accessible internet so you can be part of, of building that coalition of coalitions. Yeah. Our political systems that we have right now seem to be very much invested in uh, maintaining the status quo, even if the status quo is continually killing us. Yep. Um, and, and we see this playing out again, whether it's local politics or, or international politics, maintaining the status quo and keeping those systems and structures in place seems to, be, seems to be the number one goal. And when we want to do revolutionary change or even just something, a big project that's going to take probably several you know, generations to make happen, um, wh whether that's you know, building a dam or an LRT, uh, <laughs> It, it seems to be a lot harder for our systems and structures to do that that long-term vision planning, and uh, and again I I keep throwing the big questions at you. What what are some ways that we can get people invested in this status quo that we've been maintaining is not working? Here is something that could work better. Here's what we all have to do to do it. Can we all commit to doing it? And there used to be a time we did things like this as nations, as, mm -hmm. as cities, and we would maintain it, but now it seems to be that instant gratification thing. We need that instant gratification now, but not that I need to invest in this because the generation after me will not survive unless I do. So how do we, how do we shift that mentality and, and those systems? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> Let's solve um, the world's problems in this yeah. live stream right now, Kevin. Why not? There's <laughs> nothing good on TV, you know. Let's just. Um, yeah, you're you're exactly right. So so when I hear you say that, I a I just I, I completely agree. I think that um, 
there's a term in um, the social sciences is like the political imaginary. So like what do people think is possible politically, right? And that through, through past studies of social change, um, deprivation alone is not enough usually to create social change. It's, it's part of it, i.e. things have to suck for people to want to change them, but that's not enough. Things have to suck, but then you have to raise people's expectations too somehow. So you have to get them to believe that it doesn't have to suck, right? Or that the, the, that the current state of suckiness is illegitimate and it's like immoral or whatever sort of thing. So that whole thing about getting people to look around them and actually realize like, yeah, this is not working and it doesn't have to be this way, you know? And then I think the critical third piece, Lyle, is what you said is then can you present a vision of something that is better and different, you know? And I think that... Um, two pieces to that is one is you need to have a vision but you also need to be able to make it concrete and I just know one of the things that that really animated the Sky Dragon project was this idea of we could talk about I would consider myself for instance like a democratic eco-socialist right if someone had to like if I had to put a put a name on it well what the heck is that I mean you could blather on to someone about what that means or you could try and create a living example of it or you could try and you know um, act it out somehow right in terms of a community project or whatnot and so that was the idea is that we need again and this is I guess where it comes to institutionalizing our movements if people can see something and if they can touch it and, they, and if they can kind of even hang out in it I think that helps them understand or maybe um, it makes abstract things concrete in terms of what the world could be like, right? And I think that's partly what organizing is, is sort of creating examples of, so I love what Karen said about Plaid is like, okay, so maybe the racist douchebags are gonna be in front of City Hall, but there's also gonna be a living, breathing manifestation of peace, love, acceptance, inclusion, and diversity, you know? And you're gonna build it, you're gonna create it right there. And so you're gonna help people to see that, oh, wait a second, there's something very different. It's what pride does every year, right? And, uh, and so I just think those things are really powerful. Do we use that enough? Do we, I don't think we do as, as, as progressive movements. I don't think we use that um, understanding that if, you're, if you wanna paint someone a utopia, you better be living it in the here and now, and you better be creating little examples of it that people can sort of interact with and hang out in. Yeah, making things real is really huge. I think uh, being there as Plaid uh, throughout that summer attracted other people who were interested, but maybe interested in getting involved in different ways. A good example is uh, Anna Wilson's uh, Love and the Hammer Choir. They weren't so much into um, direct confrontation. They decided to sing and express joy and do it that way. Mm -hmm. And not only did we give them a, a concrete space to do that, what we experienced together was a feeling that we can make a difference. Whatever our special talent is, we can take that and make that part of the answer to the problem that we're trying to solve. So the idea was very new to me. Like in, in university and through most of my adult life, I've been into politics, but I was always interested in national and international politics. Mm -hmm. Took lots of American political courses, and I, I, I know a lot about their system. I was never interested in local politics. It just didn't move me until I got involved in the Sky Dragon and we got involved in saving the Lister building. Yeah. That was huge. That was yeah. an example of people power put into action. And in the food movement, um, creating something. I'm gonna make a month of special events. It's gonna be called February is Farm Month and we're gonna do things. And nobody had to give me money to make that happen, fortunately. There were enough people willing to contribute a time or space or whatever to make that happen. And when it comes to local politics, my eyes were really opened through um, facilitating participatory budgeting. Mm -hmm. I had a partner who uh, worked with me, Natalie Zernedin. She's moved to Montreal since. But um, I learned a lot about facilitating groups and giving people um, a space to express themselves and to work on a project together, something really concrete. And the idea that actually local politics is where we can have the most impact was new and mind-blowing to me. The things that we see every day, and you, you talked about this, the traffic light at the end of this street, how this intersection is designed, these extra benches that we got put into the park. If you feel as an individual that you can make these things actually happen 
that's when you get interested in municipal politics. That's when you get interested in actually showing up. And what was our turnout last time? Was it like 35%? Mm -hmm. We should be ashamed at that low turnout. But I think it's because people feel like they don't make a difference. We have to do those things, make those things mm -hmm. that give people that realization that what they say and do actually has an impact. Yeah, and, and I think that there's a dialectic too between those local things and then um, those local projects and, and community organizations and, and actions and demonstrations and then broader political processes, right? So that uh, is something that I know um, when I was growing up as a young activist, right, there was this really weird division within the movement between people who were like, all I'll do is local groovy stuff and I will never do any politics or then people who are like, you're an idiot if you do that. I'm only gonna do politics because all that stuff is, is hippie nonsense, right? Whereas over the years I sort of came to this idea that again, there, there, there's, a, there's a, a conversation, a dialectic between those two poles that is absolutely essential. You have to have both and that they energize each other if you're, if you're thinking about it right and doing it right. Because what you'll do by working on the ground, working locally, is you'll push things forward, but then you'll hit a wall. <laughs> and that wall is because of the broader structure we live in. And then you realize, oh wow, we've got to change this law. An example is around policing, right? I mean, the George Floyd protests have been amazing at you know, catalyzing really the whole world to, to realize this issue of, of police violence and, and uh, it, it needs to change, right? And then you look at, okay, well, let's change policing, right? And how the police board is, is uh, constituted and how decisions are made and you realize, Oh, but that isn't even municipal. Like a lot of these things are provincial laws. And so then, but it's part of the process of learning. Then you realize, okay, well then we got to shift gears and guess what? If we want to work on local police reform, we better be making sure we get someone good elected provincially, right? And that these things work together, you know? I think that maybe there's not so much that, I don't know if, if either of you two have encountered this, this weird thing where some people are like, no, no politics, I'm just gonna do my, my little thing. And other people are all hardcore politics. I just think we need to blend those. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And, and I like the idea um, of taking what we're learning locally and sharing it uh, on a more national scale. So we had our Facebook page for Hamilton Plaid, but we always liked the idea of extending what we were doing across the country. So when I heard about people in Red Deer who were trying to counter protest their local right wing groups and then the police coming along and not protecting them, it's like, wow, this sounds really familiar. Let's just share some of this information. So I messaged them. I sent them links to the uh, report on uh, what happened at Pride and let them know that, you know, we put up with this for about a year, but City Hall could have fixed this like months ago. Yep. So you tell your municipal leaders that that knowledge transfer, um, I think is also important uh, between the groups. Yeah. And when we have another full hour discussion, we can talk about the interrelationship between capitalism and policing. <laughs> oh, can we? We need yeah. so many hours. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. And now we only have about t less than 10 minutes left, wow. and I wanted to give you both a chance to have a final thought. Now, I'll frame your final thought for you. Our, our, our discussion is about citizens taking control, and you are both heroes of mine in Hamilton, of people that are taking control of things locally. Wow. I, I want wanted you to give a shout out to other people in our community who you're admiring what they're doing right now in our community and the things that they're doing to change the conversation and change the city we're living in for the better. Karen, uh, is there will, some yeah. folks that you'd like to give a shout out to? Top of mind, already mentioned Sarah Jama. Um, I didn't mention her by name, Amani Williams, who has organized the March for Black Lives. That young organizer with so much heart and so much openness from learning to make her events effective and safe. Hats off to them. Oh my gosh. I, I'll put it to you, Kevin, because there's just so many my, names in my mind right now. <laughs> I know, right? That's, that's a, it's, a, it's a great thing to, to mention. But I, I would say, I mean, obviously, who, who Karen mentioned, I, I'm not just because she's here and she's one of my favorite people in the world, but what Karen's been doing uh, has been really inspiring to me. I mean, uh, Lila, what you've been doing, what what the Pride community has been doing. Um, I mentioned earlier on in terms of housing, Indwell is doing incredible work. Um, I really, really like what they're up to um, in terms of trying to deal with not just affordable housing, but green affordable housing. And um, a, a little side shout out is that who they're using as their consultants around Passive House. Passive House is like this 
very hardcore standard of uh, basically uh, sustainable building, right? Um, who, who they're using as consultants are, are dear friends of mine from Toronto. They have a green building cooperative called the Fourth Pig. Mm. And um, they were instrumental, some of their members, in even getting Skydragon started up. They're, they're kind of the ones that really lit the fire about us starting as a co-op. And they're part of a network that is, is, is countrywide and it's worldwide in the sense of people really doing innovative, creative stuff to try and uh, change things. Um, options for homes too. Again, um, they've done a lot of work in Toronto. They're in Hamilton now. Uh, they do affordable condos. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of amazing things. And again, I really have to give a shout out. We did it before, but um, uh, the local labor, labor movement, I think, the Labor Council, we have really good leadership now, uh, Anthony and, and Jody. And, and, and activists like Barry. Like Barry, like Rick, like there's uh, my friend Tanya Kerr. Um, there's so many solid people that are doing work in the community right now. It's, it's, it's really incredible. Kojo Danti. Kojo, wow, yeah. <laughs> uh, Linda Lekasik, a long-term environmental yep. activist. I yep. mean, uh, Pat Reed, who's a community activist in uh, East Hamilton, out at McQuiston, has been a driving force between McQuiston Urban Farm. Yep. And what that space is doing to transform that community just makes me want to cry every time I think about yep. it. Alvaro Rodrigo and Melanie still locking it down at Plan B. Like, we do have some incredible local organizations. Don McLean just is tireless. Like. Hamilton's very unique that way. Like it's it's a gritty city. It's got the art grittiness. It's got the sort of punk history to it. Working class creativity. But man, oh man, does that ever manifest in activists and activism? And I think that it's one of the things that is beautiful about this city. We don't always win. In fact, we get knocked down all the time. But we perpetually get back up again, and it's super inspiring. Well, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Kevin, and thank you to everyone who has tuned into our live stream event. And but please, 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 please do get your copy of Reclaiming Hamilton, filled with brilliant essays from uh, amazing people, just like Karen and Kevin, uh, doing amazing things all across our city. Thank you very much, and uh, stay safe and keep well. Wear your mask, wash your hands, and socially distance. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Lila. You're welcome. Thanks.